Chapter 3. At lunch, I sat at the table and stared at my ve vegetarian bologna sandwich. Most of the other kids were waiting in the hot food line. It was either macaroni and cheese day or tuna melt day, or maybe it was both. I couldn't tell without looking at the menu because all the cafeteria food smells the same. I looked around the lunchroom and spotted Frankie. He had just bought a milk and was laughing and talking with Kate Sperling and Kim Polson, only the two most beautiful girls in the entire school. When Frankie smiles, he gets these huge dimples on his cheeks. As he walked, he kept flashing the girls the big dimples, and man, was it working. They were following him to our table. I couldn't believe it. Kate Sperling and Kim Polson were going to sit with us. This is until Robert Upchurch cut in front of them and took the seat across from me. Hey, Hank, mind if I sit here? He asked. Yes, I answered, but it was too late. When Katie and Kim saw Robert... They swerved left. At least, I think it was left. Maybe it was right. It's hard for me to keep track of directions. Anyway, they went down a totally different aisle and sat down with Ryan Shimazato and his friend. Robert isn't exactly a girl magnet. He has a neck the size of a pencil and always wears a starchy white shirt with a tie. That's right. I said a tie. And to that, the fact that he's the most boring person on the planet. And you can't blame the girls for picking another table. Frankie flopped down next to me. Thanks, Robert, he said. Nice work. What I do, Robert asked. Poor kid. He really didn't have a clue. Robert just started third grade. Since the third graders and fourth graders at my school eat lunch together, this was the first day he'd gotten a chance to sit with us. We don't really want him hanging around with us. But he lives in the same apartment building as Frankie, Ashley, and me. So he thinks he has the right to tag along everywhere. Frankly glances at my sandwich and makes a face. He's been making faces at my lunch ever since we were in preschool. I see your mom's at it again, he said. What's she calling this soy surprise? It's bologna, I told him. Bologna, and I go way back, said Frankie, and that is no bologna. I don't know if you've had vegetarian bologna before, but I don't think you've ever had my mom's vegetarian bologna. She thinks she invented it which proves she should keep her thoughts to herself. My mom's vegetarian bologna tastes like nothing you've ever put in your mouth. Let's just say it's round, ground, pinkish leaves of grass. That just says it, non-food. Ever since my mother took over Papa Pete's Deli, she has been experimenting like crazy with food. Unfortunately for me, my lunch is her laboratory. Vegetarian bologna is only one of her experiments. You haven't lived until you've tried her soy salami. Papa Pete said it's a crime what she does to salami. By the way, Papa Pete is my grandpa. He's the best. Sometimes I get the feeling that he's the only person who understands me. He never ever thinks I'm stupid or lazy. Actually, bologna is a very interesting word, Robert said through a mouthful of macaroni and cheese. Frankie and I looked at each other. You know how when you have a best friend... You and the other person often think the same thing at the same time. We were both thinking, somebody get me out of this conversation. What espe what's especially interesting is that bologna contains a silent G, just like the silent K in knock or night, Robert went on. Robert knows everything. That's why he skipped second grade. I think it's great to know a lot of things. I just don't think that you have to say them all the time. Like Robert will name all the James Bond movies in order, including the year they came out even when no one asks him. And don't even start with him on world capitals. He'll tell you the capital of Indonesia right in the middle of a dodgeball game. The other day he just looked at me and said, the human body has enough iron to make a nail. He said it like it was a totally normal thing to say. Robert, I said, why don't you go sit with the third graders? They're not interested in what I have to say, he said. We're not interested either, I said. Why not, he answered. Spelling is a very challenging subject. Challenging? I said. That's the understatement of the century. I can't spell to save my life, and it really bothers me, too. I can't imagine not being able to spell, Robert said. Does it make you feel stupid? Robert will. Will you cut zip a break, said Frankie. Can't you see he's a troubled man? What's wrong with you, Robert asked. Miss Adolph is making us write an entire five-paragraph essay, I answered. Neatness counts. Punctuation counts. Everything counts. Do you realize how impossible that is? Just then, Ashley slid onto the bench next to me and put her tray down. She had chosen both.
the mac and cheese, and the tuna melt. Ashley likes variety in everything. You should see her clothes. She covers them all with rhinestones, even her sneakers. She's got a pair with a family of dolphins swimming in the ocean in blue and green rhinestones. She glues them all over herself. What's impossible? asked Ashley. Spelling, I said. Spelling is hard, she agreed, but this but this is impossible. She picked up a cherry that was sitting on the top of her fruit salad. She popped it into her mouth and ate it. Then her face got all twisted up and busy like a chipmunk shelling an acorn. In no time, she stuck out her tongue and there was the cherry stem tied in the perfect knot. Is Ashley Wong an amazing girl or what? Ashwina. That is so cool, said Frankie. Frankie has a nickname for everyone. He even calls my dad Mr. Z. No one else I know even talks to my father. Does nobody care about my problem, I said? Is anybody listening? My friends stop eating and look at me. How am I going to write five perfect paragraphs by next Monday when I can't get what I'm thinking out down on the paper, I said. My handwriting looks like a chicken stepped in tar and ran across the page. If a chicken stepped in tar, it would get stuck and couldn't run anywhere, Robert pointed out. Shut up, Robert, we all said together. I put commas in the wrong places, I continued. My capital letters look weird. My lowercase letters look even weirder. My spelling, well, we all know about my spelling. Take a breath, Zip, said Frankie. We'll figure it out. Hey, make friends with the dictionary. Let your fingers do the walking if you know what I'm talking about. Frankie is really good at school. He thinks math is easy, and get this, he reads for fun. I wish I could do that. I wish it was easier for me to read a book. You sound like my father, I said. He's always telling me to look up words in the dictionary. Suddenly, Frankie grabbed his chest and fell to the ground, flopping around like he was some kind of alien. He's cool enough to be able to do things like this in the lunchroom. Even Kate Sperling and Kim Polson were laughing. Not at him either, but with him. That hurts, he screamed, comparing me to Silent Stan, the crossword puzzle man. That's another one of Frankie's nicknames for my dad. Frankie got up and sat back down at the table. Someone please, what's a four-letter word for a root vegetable? He said, doing this perfect imitation of my father working on a crossword puzzle. We are all cracking up. Milk came shooting out of Ashley's nose. It spewed all over her t-shirt, spraying the rhinestone self-portrait she had done. Drops of milk hung off the purple stones she had used for the frames of her glasses. Does anyone have a napkin, she asked. Here, take mine, I told her. My sandwich is never going to make it into my mouth anyway. Frankie climbed back onto the bench. Do me a favor, Zip, he said. Don't ever tell me that I sound like your father again. And don't bring up the dictionary again, I said. It's such a useless invention, at least for me. Don't tell that to Miss Adolph, said Ashley. She's in love with dictionaries. They don't make any sense, I said. I can't spell words because I can't sound them out, so how am I going to find them in the dictionary? If I can't spell them in the first place, do you know how my dictionary has 1,256 pages? Words get lost in there. Zip, you're forgetting to breathe. I know, Frankie. I'm breathing. Frankie put his hand on my shoulder. Look, it's just an essay, my man. Maybe for you, I said. For me, it's torture. Frankie reached into my lunch bag and pulled out a package of ding-dongs. He took one for himself and gave me one. Listen up, Zip, he said. We're supposed to write about what we did on our summer vacation, right? So just write about what happened to you. You had an awesome summer vacation, going to Canada, to Niagara Falls, getting to steer the boat all by yourself when the captain fell overboard. Man, that's cool stuff. Ashley nearly gagged on the second cherry stem. That's not what you told me, she said. You told me your sister got seasick and barfed all over the, your plastic raincoat. Okay, okay, so sometimes I tell stories. But they're not lies or anything. It's just that I think the world needs a little bit, enter a little bit of entertainment. I happen to be good at it, like Papa Pete says. If you got it, flaunt it. Flaunt. That's another word I can't spell. Suddenly, out of nowhere, came a big hand, bigger than the average hand, bigger than a tabletop. Then a hand the size of Rhode Island appeared. Next came the smell of bad, bad breath, the kind that makes the gel in your hair loose as it holds. That ding-dong is mine, Nick McKelty said, as he smashed what was once my chocolate cake in into his oversized mouth. I wolf this. Robert dove for cover under the table. Ashley shot milk again. Be my guess, I said. It was either that or have Nick and Tick pound my skull with his knuckles. Nick thinks that because 
he is the biggest guy in the fourth grade. Everybody's lunch is his personal meal. We are his menu, and he just takes whatever he wants. Nick was looking for his second course. My instincts told me that he was headed for Ashley's tuna melt. Nick, I said, yelling to catch his attention. You don't want to eat that. Like you're going to stop me, he said, flashing me a stupid grin. The ding-dong chocolate was wedged in the gap between his teeth, and it looked like he had three front teeth. Did you hear about the tuna that just caught that they just caught off Cape Cod that ate a license plate from a car from Ohio? I said to him, thinking fast. There was so much metal ground up inside him that by the time he got to the store, he didn't need a can. I pointed at Ashley's sandwich. That's him, in there. You could almost hear the small wheels grinding inside the huge blonde head. I didn't want that pathetic sandwich anyway, he said. I've got to save my appetite for the Knicks game tonight. My dad got tickets right next to the player's bench. Nick's father owns the bowling alley in our neighborhood. McKelty's Rolling Bowl. Maybe that's why Nick and Tick think that they have the right to act like big shots all the time. All he does is brag, and none of it is ever true. Okay, like I said before, I tell stories sometimes too. But let's get one thing straight. My stories are for pure entertainment purposes. Nick's stories are to make him seem cool, which he's not. I might add. Like he says, his father has the best seats in every sporting event in the United States of America. The truth is, mostly they watch the game on TV at the bowling alley. That's why we called, that's what we call the McKelty factor. Truth times a hundred. In any case, Nick walks away. Ashley smiles at me. Thanks, Hank, she said. I felt proud I had saved their lunch. You are amazing, Zip, Frankie said. You have so much trouble with so many things, but never with your mouth. It's a brilliant mouth. I thought about that. If my brilliant mouth worked on Nick McKelty, why couldn't it work on Miss Adolph? I took out a piece of paper and a pencil, and I had a plan.